One of the most difficult aspects of central venous catheterization for the novice user is gaining an understanding of the equipment used during the procedure. In the first two sections of this video, we will review the contents of a typical central line kit and the Seldinger technique. If you are familiar with these concepts, you may wish to skip ahead to the subsequent sections on anatomy and line insertion. Although the specific contents of a central line kit will vary by manufacturer, it will usually contain the following items. A chlorhexidine antiseptic applicator and a large sterile drape or half sheet for sterile preparation. 1% lidocaine and a 3 milliliter syringe with a 25 gauge 1 inch needle for local anesthesia. Several 5 milliliter non lure lock syringes which are used for aspiration during the insertion. A variety of needles. These include a 22 gauge 1 and 1 half inch needle that is used as a finder needle or for administration of a local anesthetic and an 18 gauge 2 and 1 half inch introducer needle that is used to cannulate the vein. A guide wire housed in a plastic assembly which is required for the Seldinger technique. Note that the guide wire has a spring-loaded mechanism that creates a 180 degree bend at the distal tip of the wire. The rounded leading edge of such J wires allows the wire to bounce off the vessel walls reducing the risk of vessel perforation. Note that the guide wire housing has a straightener sleeve that facilitates the insertion of the wire into the needle hub. An 11 blade scalpel which is used to make a nick in the skin to allow passage of the catheter through the epidermis. A dilator, which is used to create a tract in the subcutaneous tissues for the catheter. A central venous catheter. Triple lumen catheters, as pictured here, are most frequently used. Size 7 French 16 centimeter catheters are typical, but other sizes are available. Triple lumen catheters offer three infusion channels that may be used to administer a variety of fluids or medications. Sheath introducers may be chosen instead of triple lumen catheters if a transvenous pacing or pulmonary artery catheter needs to be inserted. These devices are large, 8.5 French 10 centimeter is typical, and often include a sidearm infusion port in addition to the main lumen. Finally, your kit will also include suture material used to secure the device to the patient and sterile gauze 4x4s that can be used to clean away excess blood from the field. This section will present a generic view of the Seldinger technique, which is used to place central venous catheters. If you are familiar with this technique, you may wish to skip ahead to the The next section. Many important techniques and subtleties are not included in this section, which is intended only to demonstrate the use of the equipment. Be sure to watch the entire video for a complete demonstration of the procedure. Use the 3 milliliter syringe and the 25 gauge 1 inch needle to place a wheel of anesthetic in the skin. Switch to the 22 gauge 1 and 1 half inch needle to place anesthetic into the deeper tissues. Next, attach a 5 milliliter syringe to the 18 gauge 2 and 1 half inch introducer needle and advance toward the vessel. Pull back on the plunger as you proceed. Blood will fill the syringe when the vessel is entered. Carefully remove the syringe from the needle, insert the guide wire assembly into the hub, and advance the guide wire into the vessel. Once approximately 15 centimeters of wire have been advanced into the patient, remove the plastic housing, leaving the guide wire in place. You may now remove the needle so that just the guide wire remains in the vessel. Use the 11 blade scalpel to create a small nick in the skin around the guide wire to facilitate passage of the dilator and the catheter. Carefully advance the dilator over the wire and into the subcutaneous tissues with a slight rotating motion and then remove it. Next, 
advance the triple lumen catheter over the wire and into the vessel. Finally, remove the guide wire from the catheter and place the end cap over the exposed port. If using a sheath introducer instead of a triple lumen catheter, the technique is slightly different. Fully insert the dilator into the introducer prior to the procedure. Once the guide wire has been placed, insert the dilator and the introducer as a unit into the vessel. Once fully inserted, the dilator and the wire may be removed together. The relevant surface anatomy for the internal jugular vein includes the sternal and clavicular heads of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. The internal jugular vein exits the skull at the jugular foramen and courses inferiorly between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid, ultimately joining the subclavian vein posterior to the clavicle. The carotid artery is located medial and slightly posterior to the vein. Although the internal jugular vein can be a relatively large vessel, up to two and a half centimeters in diameter, it may collapse if the patient is hypovolemic. The vein may be distended by placing the patient in the Trendelenburg position. In general, the right IJ is preferable to the left since it lies almost directly above the superior vena cava and right atrium. There are three approaches to internal jugular cannulation. For the anterior approach, first establish the location of the sternal belly of the sternocleidomastoid. With your left hand, palpate the carotid artery, which is located medial to the vein. Needle entry occurs along the medial edge of the sternal belly of the muscle at the level of the thyroid cartilage. The needle is held at a 45 degree angle to the skin and is advanced toward the ipsilateral nipple. For the central approach, establish the location of the sternal and clavicular bellies of the sternocleidomastoid. Needle entry occurs in the superior apex of the triangle formed by these muscles. The needle is held at a 45 to 60 degree angle to the skin and is advanced toward the ipsilateral nipple. For the posterior approach, establish the location of the clavicular head of the sternocleidomastoid. Needle entry occurs along the lateral edge of the muscle, one-third of the distance from the clavicle to the mastoid process. The needle is held at a 30 to 45 degree angle to the skin and is directed toward the sternal notch. Position the patient supine with the stretcher placed in 15 to 30 degrees of Trendelenburg. The bed should be at sufficient height so that you do not have to bend over or stretch during the procedure. Open the central line kit on a bedside table positioned within easy reach. Before unpacking the kit, put on a face mask, surgical cap, and a sterile gown and gloves. Next, lay out the equipment on the sterile wrapping from the kit. It is helpful to arrange the contents on the table in the order that they will be used during the procedure. Test the guide wire to make sure that it feeds easily through the straightener sleeve and then retract it before proceeding. Pre-flush the ports of the triple lumen catheter with normal saline and leave the cap of the distal port removed so that the guide wire may be advanced through it. Cleanse the skin overlying the entry site with a chlorhexidine applicator covering a wide region. Place the sterile fenestrated drape over the procedure area. Note that a large full body drape should be utilized to reduce the incidence of iatrogenic infection. In this video, the anterior approach is demonstrated. The technique for the central and posterior approaches are analogous, using the landmarks discussed in the anatomy section. If available, Bedside ultrasound should be utilized to assist with locating the vein and needle placement. In this chapter, only the blind technique is demonstrated. Palpate the carotid artery with your non-dominant hand and continue to palpate the artery during the procedure, 
in order to maintain a solid fix on its location. Then, using the 3 milliliter syringe with the 25 gauge needle, place a wheel of local anesthetic at the needle entry site, which is medial to the sternocleidomastoid muscle at the level of the thyroid cartilage. Continue to palpate the carotid artery and use the 22 gauge finder needle attached to a 5 milliliter syringe to enter the skin through the wheel. You may wish to fill the syringe with lidocaine and anesthetize the deeper tissues while advancing toward the vein. Advance the needle at a 45 degree angle to the skin aimed toward the ipsilateral nipple. Alternatively, pull back on the syringe and inject anesthetic as you advance. Entry into the vessel will be heralded by return of free-flowing, dark venous blood into the syringe. If a return of blood is not obtained within 3 to 5 centimeters, stop advancement and slowly withdraw the needle while pulling back on the plunger. Occasionally, the needle will have transfixed the vein during insertion without filling with blood, but will fill when the needle is withdrawn. If this is unsuccessful, withdraw the needle so that only the tip is under the skin, redirect slightly, and try again. If bright red pulsatile blood is returned, arterial entry has occurred and the attempt should be aborted. You have two options for placing the introducer needle into the vein. You may leave the finder needle in the vessel, stabilizing it carefully with your non-dominant hand, while you advance the introducer needle parallel to it and into the vessel. Alternatively, you may remove the finder needle after first noting its exact location and depth of insertion. Then, insert the introducer needle along the same trajectory, aspirating as you advance until the vein is entered. Once the vessel has been entered, secure the hub of the needle with your non-dominant hand, taking care not to advance or withdraw the needle. Remove the syringe and immediately occlude the hub with your finger to prevent air embolism. Next, insert the tip of the guide wire straightener sleeve into the hub and begin to advance the wire into the vessel with the thumb of your dominant hand. In general, no more than 15 centimeters of wire should be inserted to avoid advancing the wire into the heart. Some guide wires have markings every 10 centimeters along the wire to assist with estimation of depth of insertion. If the guide wire does not pass with ease, stop and recheck for free return of blood from the needle with a syringe. If you are having trouble advancing the guide wire, withdraw it slightly, rotate it a bit, and try to re-advance. It is absolutely essential to never let go of the guide wire once it has been inserted to prevent migration and loss of the wire into the central circulation. Once the wire has been advanced, First remove the guide wire housing and then the needle, leaving the guide wire in the vessel. Be careful to always maintain a firm grip on the wire. Next, use the 11 blade scalpel to enlarge the puncture site, making sure you do not cut the guide wire in the process. In this video, we demonstrate the insertion of a triple lumen catheter. If you are inserting a sheath introducer, Follow the steps described in the Seldinger Technique section. Hold the very tips of the dilator and the guide wire to steady them and advance the dilator over the wire. Advance the dilator through the skin and into the vessel. Again, make sure that you always have a firm grip on the wire at all times. You may encounter some resistance during dilator advancement. A slight rotating motion may be helpful. You may now remove the dilator, leaving the guide wire in the vessel. Next, advance the triple lumen catheter over the guide wire. You must grasp the wire from the distal end hub before fully advancing the catheter into the vessel. Once the catheter has been placed, remove the guide wire and immediately cover the hub with your finger. Finally, place an end cap onto the open hub and flush all of the ports with saline. Secure the line in place with a stitch and place a sterile dressing over the line in accordance with local institutional policies. 
A chest radiograph should be obtained after all internal jugular line insertions to assess for proper positioning of the catheter tip in the superior vena cava and to evaluate for iatrogenic pneumothorax.